explain the Stuart piano in a nutshell, it's a, uh, an attempt to redefine the acoustic piano from the, uh, the 19th century uh, uh, standard instrument that we've all grown up with. As far back as I can remember, I was fascinated by the box that uh, you saw in many, many people's home called a piano. And then I became determined that I really wanted to learn how to play them and uh, also more about the instrument itself. I was born in Tasmania and brought up on a farm. I wasn't able to actually get to formal lessons until I was probably 11 or 12. But I obviously picked up the instrument very quickly and before that I was playing it a bit by ear. By the time I was early teens I had uh, acquired enough skills to actually play a lot of the old time dance repertoire. And so uh, various members of the, uh, the family, immediate and extended, we would tout ourselves around the hall playing for these old time dancers. By the time I was probably 16, I'd played, you know, probably 100 pianos. And I had drawn certain conclusions from this. Why some pianos were easier to play than others. Why you could play two or three or even four hours on some pianos and feel uh, uh, enlivened. And on others, you wanted to take an ax to them. Although initially I approached the instrument by ear, I was enthralled with the sounds of the instrument. So that was always a very big motivator in how I played the instrument. But I did learn to read and reading became a fairly important uh, aspect of playing because it's the only way you can access the repertoire. I managed to land a cabinet making apprenticeship. In my third year, there was a, a newspaper article talking about a piano technician course that they were about to implement at the Sydney Conservatory of Music. I think I jumped on the phone and uh, I telephoned the conservatorium. They sent down the relevant information and within a week or two weeks, I was on a plane. And when I stepped onto that plane, I knew that I wasn't going back to Tasmania. In 1975, I was very fortunate in winning an Australia Council study grant to go to Japan for a year to study with Yamaha. I was thrust into the bowels of the largest piano maker of all time. I mean, they were building about 150,000 pianos a year at the time. It wasn't until the 60s that Yamaha uh, became interested in the concert uh, platform and started to build a full concert grand piano. When I went there in 1975, the focus to, to build a piano, a full concert piano that really could challenge Steinway was in full flight and uh, the concert grand production area was separate from the main production area. The pianos were essentially hand-built. Uh, there was enormous effort and energy being uh, pushed into uh, uh, the design and building of a definitive concert piano. I knew at the time, without any doubt, that uh, for me to, to have uh, gone from Australia to Japan as the first port of call post my initial training was the best possible course um, I could have taken uh, in developing uh, my career because uh, the Japanese had analysed the entire process so that they could then communicate it to a peoples who had no idea about how to do these things and therefore you have to have a very good education system in place. But 
the sound that came from America during those periods had great clarity. The basses were good and the, the, it had enormous power. It was a wholly desirable sound. It was the freest sound, not just the Steinway, but the American, the best of the American makers during that period produced what I consider a modern sound. They were the most advanced pianos of our time. The frustration for me between the uh, New York Steinway and the Hamburg Steinway was uh, one was definitely the Dow Durant and uh, it had no lift, it didn't have the lyricism, it didn't have the, uh, the vitality or the brilliance. In effect what had happened, the piano had been Germanicised, it had been made to sound like other German pianos. pursued a further training in Europe. I went to work with Steinway and with Bösendorfer and, and Renner and uh, Gradrin Steinweg and, and Beckstein and so on and so forth. Uh, I got another Australia Council study grant to go there for a year. What the European experience confirmed in me was that Japan was fantastic. That what it was doing was to technically drag the piano out of the craft consciousness of Europe, if you like. On the way back from Europe, I dropped into America, but I didn't have a great desire to actually work in America because I was very aware of the skill standards in America. But I visited the Steinway factory in New York. It was quite obvious at that time why the pianos sounded differently. They used different materials, there were different techniques, but the, uh, the focus was very different. The people are a, co are a collective of uh, the sum total, and the instrument will be as a consequence of that. On returning to Australia late 1979, I had to determine how I might go about establishing a piano uh, facility or how would I build my piano in Australia. So uh, after 12 years training people, doing the research and development, bringing together the, uh, uh, the designs uh, for an upright and a full concert piano, I was ready. Uh, we had built the pianos, we had refined the ideas and we had determined or practically demonstrated that there was a new sound of a hand, that I could actually build a sound that would be more responsive to the vertical colour of sound, to the physical properties of sound that the contemporary composers had been writing into their works for really since the Impressionists. After the upright prototype uh, had been sort of proven, put through its traces as it were, I was seconded for a couple of years to, uh, uh, to build a uh, full concert grant. Uh, you get one chance to do these things and then it's oblivion <laughs> if it doesn't work. Is this real? Walking to and fro and then uh, going away and then coming back. No, it's, this, it's not right. It's not right. You can't do it. You can't do it. You just, it's just two way out. And the first instrument really was, uh, it was an extraordinary piano. In actual fact, it is still used at the conservatorium here in, in Newcastle. And uh, many people still love it. They think it's, uh, uh, it, well, some say it's the best piano I've made. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> When the prototype was built in Melbourne, I knew that my time had come, being in that limited institution, 
But during the course of the year, the uh, University of Newcastle, Professor Robert Constable had been keeping an eye on me. He came down and uh, looked at the project and I said, Robert, I think we've probably gone about as far as we can go here. What's next? So he said, look, I'm very interested in this project and uh, uh, the implications for Australian music. We then started uh, to uh, think about relocating the project to the next stage, putting it back into the conservatoria where we could uh, then introduce it to the musicians and also over a period of time trial it in all sorts of contexts. So uh, long story short, the whole project came to Newcastle uh, and that's why we're here. With these pianos, I've presented four pedals to the, uh, the pianist. The three on the right side of the box are the standard pedals you'll see on a, on a, uh, a normal grand piano. The fourth, or the left pedal, actually reduces, it moves the key, keys and the hammers in a vertical plane. The next pedal in moves the hammers and keys in a horizontal plane they influence the dynamic level of the piano and the texture of the sound. A piano is nothing more than a Greek harp <laughs> with, with a few more strings on it. Really? No, that's essentially all it is. It's an arrangement of stretched wire um, covering eight, nine octaves, as many octaves of, as you can make yes. um, at certain tension. And then you couple a, uh, a speaker cone to it. The speaker cone, being the iron frame, yes. weighs about 200 kilos, and then the cabinet that goes around it has to be able to support that. But the, uh, the actual speaker cone, or the thing that moves the air, is the diaphragm, the uh, soundboard. During the course of the six years at the conservatorium, we just had a stream of pianists coming in from all over the world. It was the venue for Music of Eva, and I will never forget the, uh, the first night the piano was actually played by the Guarneri Trio. The piano had been delivered during the afternoon, and uh, uh, Professor Constable had indicated that uh, it wasn't to be put out for the evening concert. So the trio came in, and um, the pianist sort of played the style and he said, and what's that over there? Because the piano was veneered in human pine and so it was, there was no mistaking, it was a brilliant statement in cabinet work. Anyhow, he went over and played on it and uh, I want this one. The pianist took to it like a duck to water. Despite the protestations coming from uh, Professor Constable, the piano was wheeled into centre stage and used for the evening concert. When the audience came in, the, the lights were low and all of a sudden they were raised and of course this brilliant golden human pine piano just shone on the stage and the audience gasped. One day we had a phone call. It was revealed at the end of the call that he was ringing on behalf of uh, Rowan Atkinson. He'd like to come to the factory. 
in Newcastle and have a look at what we're doing. He came to the factory and, and after spending the best part of a day talking with staff and, and ascertaining what we do do, he commissioned the first 2.2 metre piano that we ever made. When I visited the piano in the UK to service it after its delivery, the, the instrument was in, in the music room. It was not necessarily on display, it was there as a workhorse. Rowan came in at the end of the day and uh, we had a glass of, uh, of uh, New Zealand Chardonnay. <laughs> I cannot forget the day that Macari Campanella came in. He came to Newcastle specifically to play this piano. He had heard much about it. The sound and the exploration of that piano was just extraordinary. Uh, <clears throat> he gave a concert in the evening and uh, the concert continued to 11 o'clock because he just wanted to keep exploring the piano and he apologised to the, uh, the audience that uh, you know, this was his desire. to see the reactions, the, the extreme reactions in some cases, when you throw down four pedals and eight octaves and how uh, a musician that has been narrowed down to three pedals and, and 88 keys for their entire life, how they cope. Some cope very well, some don't cope well at all. We had players like Stephen Huff coming in and uh, uh, he just fell in love with one of them and. and the sounds that came from it, he could in, in no time at all grasp the, the overall concept of what the piano was, how to use the pedals and so on and so forth. People who listened to what they play were the ones who really immediately embraced this piano and that's really been what's driven it. The acoustic piano still is that quintessential exposition, if you like, of the, uh, the, the Western ego uh, exposed on a concert platform where someone walks out uh, essentially alone without a plug in their hand to put into the nearest power socket, where they have to actually uh, interact with a, cons a, a, a beast, actually, and uh, uh, a repertoire that goes back for centuries and to bring life into the, this whole experience, but yet to keep it vital, to keep it um, vibrant. And the, the art or the role of the instrument maker is so intrinsically linked with the performer, with the repertoire, with the, with the experience, if you like, on that concert platform. Underneath the great style, underneath the great instruments, there are always individuals like me who started those enterprises, if you like, based on these sorts of dreams of exploration. I would be appalled to think that in 150 years someone is copying the recipe that I derived. I see no honour in reproduction or copying. I only see honour in creativity and exploration.